I'd like to begin this morning by thinking about John the Baptist. Do you remember John the Baptist? Never had a haircut. Can you imagine? Never shaved. He was a Nazarite set aside. That's a special, special vow that the Jews could make. But he was a Nazarite, not just for a year, not just for a few weeks. He was a Nazarite for his entire life. He wore a strange coat of camel's hair that was the symbol of being a prophet. He had a leather belt around his waist. We remember what he had for lunch. What, what did John the Baptist have for lunch? Locusts and honey. So honey dipped locusts. We're not having that this afternoon, right? Okay, I just wanted to, wanted to clarify that. But now, John the Baptist had a very simple message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What does that mean? Repent, we know that. That's, that's a 180 degree turn. As we turn away from sin and we turn all the way back to God. A 90 degree turn would be turning away from sin. A 180 degree turn means we turn past sin and we turn to God. John said repent. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus said the same thing. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is the promise of God, that God will be in control, that it is a new age, and we are on the cusp of the new age. It's very much like announcing Jesus is coming again, and we're excited about that. Think about the changes. It's a very similar message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, Easter wasn't that long ago. Jesus died on the eve of the Passover 2,000 years ago on Easter, the pa uh, Passover moon, that full moon. And then he was resurrected on Sunday, and we celebrate that. Not just resuscitated. It's not like they put the paddles on him, zapped him, and Jesus is alive again. He's resurrected. That means Jesus will never die again. Now, for the next 40 days, Jesus presented himself to different people alive. He appeared on the Emmaus Road. We just recently talked about that. He appeared to Mary in the garden. He appeared to the apostles in the upper room. Now, it's not like a ghostly appearance. Although Jesus could walk through locked doors and windows and appear in the room, he was there. It's not like he was a phantom because, as Thomas found out, you could actually touch Jesus. A ghost, you try to touch him, your hand goes right through. Jesus had a body. In fact, to prove to the apostles that he was alive, because they were flabbergasted just as we would, he said, do you have anything to eat? And so Jesus sat down and ate breakfast, and they watched him eat the fish and the bread, and they knew that Jesus was alive. Now, he appeared and then would vanish. He would appear and then vanish. At one time, he appeared before 500 people at one time. Mass hallucination? Not very likely. He appeared to uh, James, his brother. His brother believed that he was crazy, but when Jesus was resurrected, James became a believer and was one of the leaders in the early church. Jesus was resurrected, and he appeared to people for a period of 40 days. Now, we remember Easter, right? It wasn't that long ago. That was about 40 days ago. In other words, can you use your imagination and picture yourself there during that 40-day span? That wasn't that long ago, Easter. And then on the 40th day, Jesus gathered with his apostles, and he climbed to the top of the Mount of Olives. Now, the Mount of Olives is across the Kidron Valley from Jerusalem. This is a picture, a view of what it would have looked like from the top of the Mount of Olives in the days of Jesus. There we can see the temple prominently. Can you picture yourself with Jesus climbing to the top of the Mount of Olives it's only about a three-quarters of a mile walk from the city of Jerusalem to the base of the Mount of Olives, and then a little bit farther to the top. And there on top, do you feel 
the anticipation with the apostles and the disciples, what would it have been like? You remember not that long ago, Jesus came from the Mount of Olives to the city of Jerusalem, and then he was crucified. But now we leave the city and we climb to the top and we look down on the temple. Is this it? You remember the message of John the Baptist? You remember the message of Jesus? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Is this it? You feel the excitement as we've all gathered there. The thing that we've been longing for, the thing that we've been praying for, the thing that we've hoped for, wished for, it is now about to happen. Let's open our Bibles together. It'll be helpful to have a Bible this morning. Open your Bible to the book of Acts chapter 1 verses 6 through 11. And if you didn't bring a Bible, you're welcome to use one of ours found in the pew rack in front of you or scoot over next to your neighbor. But let's all follow together from the book of Acts, chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Stop. Let's look at the text. They asked him. Now, those words... Remember, the New Testament was originally written in Greek. And in the Greek language, it's not just they asked him, like I asked a question, but it's like they pestered him. They, they were, this is the comment that is on, this is the question that is on everyone's mind. Lord, is this it? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Is this it? Lord, is it now? Is it now? And they're all saying the same thing. It's on their hearts. But look at Jesus' response. It's not for you to know the times or the seasons. Uh, by the way, people are still asking that question, aren't they? I mean, that's the topic I get asked about a lot in coffee shops and going out and meeting with people when they find out the number of preacher. Well, when is Jesus coming back? Is this the end of the world? They'll say, you know, the prophecies, it sure sounds like this is the end of the world. What does Jesus tell his apostles? not for you to figure the times or the seasons. Not because you're forbidden for that, but it's God's prerogative. God is in control, and God is scheduling all of these events. Your focus needs to be on something else. What is it that Jesus wants them to think about? Let's continue reading. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Think, think about that. There is a promise and a mission in these words. What's the promise? You will receive power. you to think about that he's talking about us that we receive power do you feel like a powerful individual this morning you are it's amazing the holy spirit has ushered in a new age we're going to talk more about that in a minute but it's not just a promise that you'll receive power from the holy spirit but it's also you have a mission you will be my witnesses by the way you want to put a note in the margin of your Bible, the word witnesses there, that's our English word martyr. You will be my martyrs. A martyr is someone who witnesses. Now, we give it a specialized term. They witness with their life. I will die because I believe that this is true. You will be my witnesses. Jesus doesn't call on us to just believe like Peter Pan does. If you believe, you can fly. It is belief that is founded on evidences. We have 12 witnesses that saw Jesus alive. There were more than that, but these 12 men were special witnesses. They had seen everything that Jesus did, beginning with his baptism, through the Sermon on the Mount, through raising the dead, healing the sick, preaching, teaching, 
prophesying, sharing the parables and the stories. They saw all that Jesus did. They heard all that Jesus had to say. And they saw him alive after he was dead. They are witnesses. And because of those witnesses, we have a foundation for our belief. Now focus on the cloud. I used to think about this, well, they're they're standing on the top of the Mount of Olives, and Jesus is there, and then suddenly he starts levitating, and he goes up, it's, wow, he goes up in the air, and then he he gets so high that he's lost in those cumulus clouds, like on a, a beautiful, like a day like today. But that's not what the scripture says. A cloud took him out of their sight. Now, it's interesting, when you start looking through the Bible, that's found many different places. When God appeared at the tabernacle, he appeared in a cloud. He led the Israelites in a cloud. Elijah is taken up in the whirlwind. In the book of Revelation, we have the two witnesses, and the witnesses die, and they come back to life, and then a cloud comes from heaven, and carries them away. Jesus is carried away on this cloud. It is an appearance of God. It's not a magic trick as as Jesus levitates and somehow flies like Superman or a superhero into the heavens. Jesus is taken up on this cloud. Can you see it? Now, they're still looking into heaven. Wouldn't you do the same thing? You saw this this thing, and and they're wide-eyed, slack-jawed, amazed at Jesus. And suddenly, as we continue our reading, and while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. Who were those men? Angels. This is the typical way that the Bible describes angels. At the tomb earlier, there were two angels, men dressed in white, that uh, gave them the first good news about Jesus being alive again. So these are angels that are making the announcement. And what did the angels say? Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Why do you stand looking into heaven? Jesus said, go into the world. There is work to be done. It's no time for us to sit around and and wonder. There is an urgency to the gospel. Now, one of the things that's happened over the last 2,000 years is that we've gotten comfortable. Now, I know pews aren't the most comfortable thing. If they were comfortable, they'd be called uh, lazy boys. But they're not. They're called pews. Now, they are kind of comfortable because we we have these pads on them. We have an air-conditioned, heated building. We have nice lights, a good sound system. Uh, What I'm saying is I wonder sometimes if we haven't gotten too comfortable. We've lost the sense of urgency. When the men and women left the top of the Mount of Olives, what do you think they did? What would you do if you just saw Jesus go into heaven and the angels announced that he's coming back? What would you do? Well, I would run, tell my brother. I would run, tell my sisters. I would run and tell my friends. There's an urgency. Jesus went up. He's coming back. But we've gotten a little bit comfortable. So the message that the angels gave to those people is the same message that they would give to us. It's time to get up. It's time to get going. It's time to get busy. Why stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, stop. Every word in the Bible is important. The angels didn't say, this Christ, this king, this prophet, this Messiah. What does the angel say? This Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, 
Jesus is their friend, their master. They have a personal relationship with him. And the angels say, even though he's gone to heaven, he is still Jesus. Before he came to earth, he was known as Bible students? Logos. Yeah, he was the Logos, the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But when Jesus came to earth, when he became a human being, he received a name, Jesus. And we, like the apostles, we, like the disciples, are on a first name basis with Jesus. I want you to think about why that's good news. We'll talk about that in just a second. But let's uh, continue our reading. There are four points to the gospel. What does gospel mean? Good news, right? Good news. And just as you see a cross and there are four arms to the cross, there are four points to the good news. The first one is what we call the incarnation. That's the the lower part of the cross. There is a bridge between heaven and earth. God, in the form of the Son, came to earth and became a human being. That's good news. Why? Because it tells us there is a God. He cares about us because he came down, and he not only gave us, told us good news, told us what to do, he showed us what to do. Jesus is the example. The incarnation is good news. The second point of the cross is the atonement. That's a fancy theological word. That means that Jesus has made it possible for us to be friends with God again. You see, our sin separated us from God. It spoiled that relationship. But now Jesus through his great sacrifice, has made it possible for us to be friends with God again. Jesus renews the relationship. That's the second point of the gospel. But today, we're talking about the exaltation. That's the top because that's pointing towards heaven. Exaltation, let me get a second. We'll move on to the fourth point before we move, uh, go on farther. The fourth point of the gospel is the return. Jesus is coming back. That was the promise that the angels made to the disciples. That's the promise that is made to us. Jesus is coming back. This world is not my home. I'm okay, we're going to break out in song in a second. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Scott's a better song leader than I am. All right? Jesus is coming back to put things right. This world is a mess. Global warming, this world is a mess. Hunger, war, disease, MasterCard, this world is a mess. This world is a mess. But Jesus is coming back with a new heaven and a new earth and will put all things right. That's also part of the good news. Well, let's go back to the third point of the gospel, which is the exaltation. That's what we're talking about today, because on this date, 2,000 years ago, Jesus left the top of the Mount of Olives and returned to heaven. And there's really three parts of the exaltation as well. Number one, Jesus was resurrected. He didn't just die and then as a ghost go on to heaven. He came back to life again, human, God, together. We, as human beings, have a body and a soul. And body and soul, we will be resurrected. And that's the, the triumph. And the exaltation gives us that, that story, that glory. The second point is, Jesus didn't just come back to life and walk around on earth. He ascended into heaven. Now, I asked you a few minutes ago to think about why is that good news? Do you have a friend in a high place? Okay, I'm having some trouble with the DMV. Do you know anybody over at the DMV that can help me? I'm having a little problem with my taxes. Do you know anybody over at the tax place that's 
can help me? Do we have a friend in a high place? We have a friend in heaven, and we are on a first-name basis. Remember what the angel said? This Jesus, we know him by the first name. That's good news. Jesus has ascended into heaven. He is in the throne room of God. And number three, Jesus is sitting on the throne. Thrones represent power. Jesus is reigning. It's easy, maybe, to think that Jesus has gone off on a coffee break. That he's in heaven right now, and he's talking it over with the prophets and those who have gone on before, and they're drinking some coffee, and the coffee in heaven's got to be really good. But that's not it. Jesus isn't on a coffee break. What is Jesus doing today? What is the floor of heaven, the throne room in heaven, made out of? Crystal, clear as glass. We can see God is watching. Jesus is watching what's going on. In the book of Revelation, in the first couple of chapters, Jesus is walking among the seven lampstands. The lampstands represent the churches. There is, I think, a lampstand in heaven with Sunnyside's name on it. Jesus is vitally concerned with what's going on here and now in this place. In fact, if you will, Jesus is here with us today. And that's good news. We are not left alone. And that's the good news of the third point of the gospel, the exaltation. I should have asked you to reach under the pew this morning before we got started and pull out your thinking cap because this is one of those theological lessons. Uh, did I mention there's going to be a test at the close of services today, uh, you remember the four points of the gospel, the three points of the exaltation? No, that's, I'm sorry. But I do hope that you'll remember these things. Uh, now, one person I was reading this week said, you know, the ascension sounds like a bad idea. Have you thought about it? It's very much like we get the very best player, the amazing player on our team, and just in time for the game, we put him off on the sidelines. What if Jesus would have stayed on earth and he's still alive 2,000 years later? Wouldn't that have made an impact on the world? If we could say, now Jesus is over here. He's still alive. And, and we could hear him preaching and teaching. He could go on a worldwide tour. Doesn't that sound like the way to spread the gospel? And so at first glance, the ascension sounds like a bad idea. But what was it that Jesus said in the upper room at the Lord's Supper? Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus is talking about the new age. Now, it was wonderful when Jesus was here, gathered in the upper room with his disciples. But the new age, Jesus says, is even better because I will send the Holy Spirit. And where does the Holy Spirit live today? In each of our hearts. When we are baptized, two things happen. 38, our sins are washed away and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, God doesn't live in the stone temple in Jerusalem anymore. The Holy Spirit lives in the temple of our life. I want you to think about that. The Holy Spirit, Jesus is here. The Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit is with you every step of the way. And yet for many Christians, it's very much like receiving a present at Christmas. You know, it's got all that beautiful silver foil wrapper on it with a red ribbon and a beautiful bow and all the decorations and even a cute card. What if you were to take that package and say, this is too nice to open up, and you set it up on the mantle above the fireplace where you can see it every day? A lot of Christians are like that. We've got this package, but we don't open it up. Now, what happens when you open up the package? Does it become robotic? Do you start doing weird things? Do you do you act like you're possessed? No. The Holy Spirit is working with us, giving us power for real 
change. We don't know how to pray to God, but the Holy Spirit knows what's in our hearts, and he takes our prayers directly to God. The Holy Spirit gives us power for real change. We see Jesus, our older brother. We want to be like Jesus. The Holy Spirit gives us the power for that change. And you know what? When I see you this morning, I'm, I'm looking at you just like you're looking at me. When I see you, I don't just see you. I see the Spirit within you. And if the Holy Spirit lives in you and the Holy Spirit lives in me, what's that make us? Family, that we care about each other, that we love each other. Jesus says this new age that began when he returned to heaven, this new age of the Spirit is the greatest age. But we need to come in contact with that Spirit. We'll talk more about the Spirit next week. Because do you know what next Sunday is? Graduation Sunday. Well, it's graduation Sunday, that's true. But it is also historically Pentecost, the day that the Holy Spirit came. We'll talk more about that. If you want to read ahead, it's found in the very next chapter. You're in Acts chapter 1 now. Go on to Acts chapter 2 and learn about the coming of the Holy Spirit and the birthday of the church. Hudson read just a moment ago from Luke chapter 24, verses 50 through 53. And he led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. What was the reaction of the disciples? It should be the same as our reaction. First, they worshipped him. We praise, we adore we worship the Lord. What is worship? Worship does two things. In worship, number one, we glorify God. We recognize God. We open up our eyes and we see God. Jesus is here with us. The Holy Spirit lives in us. God the Father is with us. And we see this by opening up our eyes and worshiping God. But they were not only worshiping God, they also were filled with great joy. Now, we think about joy being tied to happiness. Oh, I've got a great present. Or, oh, I've got the drumstick. You know, oh, good circumstances make good, happy times. But Christian joy is made of tougher stuff than that. The apostles knew, I believe Jesus told them over and over again what was going to happen. He told them, you've got to pick up your cross daily and follow after me. Hard times, but they are still filled with joy. You have a joy that cannot be taken away because of your faith and because Jesus returned to heaven. And number three, they went away blessing God. Another way to translate that, probably an easier one to understand, is praising God. Do you praise God this morning? Why? Because he's given us hope. Hope that is a, a purpose to life. Hope that this life isn't all that we wait for. Hope that, that this life isn't it. There's something greater coming. And we praise God for all of these things. And so as we close this lesson this morning, I want you to answer the question, why is this good news for us? The incarnation, the atonement, the ascension, and the return. There is purpose to this life. And if your life is without purpose this morning, if you're wandering around trying to make sense of it all, come to Jesus this morning. If you're not yet a Christian, do you believe in God? I know you do or you wouldn't be here, right? It's not to hear the great preacher. It's not to sit on these pews. We've come to be in the presence of God. Do you believe? If you do, are you willing to confess that Jesus is the Christ? He's who he says he was. And having confessed, have you repented of your sins? Turned, we talked about that. And are you willing to begin life again? Have your sins washed away in baptism? 
and begin life new and whole and fresh. Whatever your spiritual need, won't you come right now while together we stand and sing. <laughs>